All right, it really is good to be here today and good to see all of you here. And, and, and we're going to, since it's, since it's um, the Sunday before Labor Day, we are going to talk about work, wisdom for work. Do you know that America is one of the few places in the world that celebrates hard work? <laughs> That's what this Labor Day holiday is all about. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that a lot of people in the world today, they don't even know what Labor Day is all about. They just know that we get Monday off. Labor Day is a celebration of generations and generations and generations of hard-working Americans that made this country the great nation that it is today, that made this country the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. And God has just done an amazing thing in America because he has a plan for America, and he used generation after generation of hard-working Americans to get that done. Now, this is not a partisan political statement. This is simply reality. Today in America, our government has moved away from the ideas of the founding fathers that individual responsibility and a willingness to work hard can bring about prosperity. And they have moved to the idea that people are poor, that people don't have enough for whatever reason, and that the government should step in and provide. And you know what the result of that has been? A huge welfare system that is such a burden on the financial stability of this nation that we are way past bankrupt. Are you aware of that? Your great-grandchildren are going to pay the bill. That's how big the U.S. national debt is. Our government needs to apply principles of Scripture about the responsibilities of able-bodied men and women to work. That's what needs to happen. That's what made America great to begin with, was generation after generation of hardworking Americans. Listen, we don't need to reward laziness. Can I say that again and not offend anybody? You say, I'm offended. I'm going to say it again anyway. You don't need to reward laziness. Do you get that? And so we're going to talk today about wisdom for work. Wisdom for work. For work, Genesis chapter 2, verse number 2. We're going to go back way toward the beginning. This is what Moses wrote. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. Get that. God was working, and he worked six days. And by the seventh day, he had finished the what? The work. He had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Let's pray. Father, we've read from your word, and Lord, we're going to look at several more verses of Scripture. And Lord, I know that when your word goes out, it will never return void. It always accomplishes that for which you sent it out. You've commanded us to preach the word. You've told us that the word, your word, is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. So, Lord, use your word to cut into our hearts today and cut out anything that doesn't need to be there and provide for us, Lord, an understanding of you and your will and your ways. And, Lord, help us to leave here today with a new appreciation for what you expect of us when it comes to work. I pray that in Jesus' name. And amen. So, so as I said, since today is the day before Labor Day, I thought it would be just kind of fitting for us to explore what the Bible says about work. In fact, the title of today's sermon, as I said, is Work for wis or Wisdom for Work. And so to begin with, I want to point out that one of the first times we're introduced to God in the Bible, he had just finished a week's work. You get that? God was a working man. God set the example early when we're introduced to God in the verse that we've already read. He had just finished a week's work. That's what Moses wrote. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. So in short, from this verse, we learn that God is a worker. We learn that God believes in not only working, but God believes in hard work. He really does. I mean, making light making the atmosphere, the oceans, the land, all kinds of vegetation, all kinds of trees, the sun, the stars, the planets, all kinds of marine creatures, the livestock, the reptiles, the wildlife, and then mankind had been a week's 
worth of work, and it was hard work. In fact, nobody has ever equaled the amount of work that God got done in a week. Do you get that? Hard work. God worked so hard that week that when he finished his work, he needed to rest. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Do you get that? So if you don't learn anything else today, remember that God is a worker. And if we are going to be like him, following his example, we must be willing to work. Now this isn't the only time we find God working. When Jesus healed the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda, the Pharisees criticized Jesus for working on the Sabbath day. Now there are some limitations to work, and we're going to talk about that as we go along here. But they criticized Jesus for working on the Sabbath day. And in response, Jesus said this in John 5, 17. He said, my father is always working. Do you get that? So what is it that characterizes this God that we know? He consistently works, and when he works, he works hard. He's a worker. My father is always working, Jesus said, and so am I. So did you get that? Jesus said it. His father has a great work ethic. In fact, Jesus said he's always working. By his very nature, God is a worker, a hard, consistent worker. Now here's something else you need to understand. Man was created in the image and likeness of of God. Moses wrote about that in, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. And since God created man in his image and in his likeness, and since God is a worker, then man was created to be a worker. You get that? If we're created in the likeness of God and God's a worker, then we were created to be a worker. We know that God created Adam to work because immediately after creating him, God placed Adam in a garden and God gave him a work assignment. Are you aware of that? The first thing that he did for Adam once he created him was he gave him a work assignment. Moses wrote about it. In, in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 15, he wrote, The Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So the evidence is clear that God created humans to work because he created Adam, he put him in a garden, and now he said, Get after it, buddy. Work on it. Take care of it. He put him there to work the garden. That was his first work assignment. It's against God's will. Now, I know this is not one of those fun, feel-good kind of sermons, but I don't know what to tell you. It's in the book. It is against God's will for able-bodied human beings to refuse to work. I understand that there are some people who can't work. I also understand that there are a lot of people who could work but don't want to, and so they want you to think that they can't work. If you have the ability to do some kind of work, you ought to be doing it. And so look at this. It's against God's will for an able-bodied human being to refuse to work. Paul explained that fact to the believers in Thessalonica. This is what he wrote. This is right out of the book. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 10. If anyone will not work, now get this, it doesn't say cannot work, but what does it say? If anyone will not work, then what? Neither shall he eat. What does that mean? If you're not willing to work, you don't need to eat. You say, well, that's crazy. I'll starve. You're beginning to get the point. God's cure for laziness is hunger. Trust me, people get hungry enough and they will do something. They will work. If they get hungry enough, you say, no, they won't, they'll break the law. Then, depending on the severity of their crime, maybe they need to be in prison or maybe they need to be executed. Either way, God has a solution. Do you understand that? God has a solution for all of that. 
while I'm on that. You know, I'll get in trouble now because I'm leaving my notes. While I'm on that, some of you won't like this, but I got to tell you this. Our prison system is all messed up today. Get that? Our prison system is all messed up today. Now, you may want to take those claps back when I explain what I'm going to explain. You put people in prison, most of the time, they're locked in a cell. They have a bed to sleep on. They have a toilet to use. They have meals brought to them. You know, they got all this stuff. And the rest of us are paying for that. Guess what? People in prison ought to have to work to support the prison. Can I say that? Can I say that? That is simply biblical. Let me say one thing. We work in prison. Good. Good deal. Good deal. DA, you need to go see about him. All right, this is what needs to happen, is we need to be working. I'm simply preaching to you what the book says. The book clearly says that we need to be working, and so we got to deal with that. we got to deal with that right out of the book. If any man will not work, neither shall he eat. Now, I said this before, and I'll say it again. The best cure for laziness is hunger. Paul was practicing what he was preaching when he wrote this to the Thessalonians. This is what he wrote. It's in 1 Thessalonians 2, 9. Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we did what? How hard we worked among you. Night and day we did what? Toiled to earn a living. So what does Paul set the example for? The greatest Christian that ever lived changed the world more than any other single human being other than Jesus. What did Paul do? What did he do? He said, we worked. We worked. So Paul set the example of, of hard work while still actively engaged in ministry. Some people have the idea that, you know, if God calls you into ministry, then the, that you're excused from work. Is that true? Now, your ministry may be your work, and God may provide for you through that, and that's okay. But just because you're called into ministry, does that mean that you're excused from work? I'm talking about secular work? No, not at all. Um, the Apostle Paul was called into ministry, and he did great ministry, but at the same time, he made tents. He was a tent maker. And so we've got to understand that. So let's look at some wisdom for work. There seems to be a constant frustration with work. Even on your best day, there's something that irritates you about your job. Isn't that true? How many of you have been there? On your best day, there's something that irritates you about that job. And if, if, if you're an average full-time employee in America today, you will work, and I want you to get this, you will work approximately 94,000 hours in your lifetime. That's a lot of work, isn't it? 94,000 hours in your lifetime. You'll work more than that if you're self-employed or you own a small business. If any of you are self-employed or ever had your own business, you work more than 40 hours a week. So you'll work more than that, 94,000 hours, if you're self-employed or you own your own business. So the average lifespan and of American worker today is 70, or of an American today is 78 years and seven months. Did you know that? On average, Americans live 78 years and seven months today. And so that means if you're going to work 94,000 hours in your lifetime, that means that if you are an average American worker and you live the average lifetime and you begin working on your 18th birthday, you're going to live an average of 60 years and 7 months as an adult. Take off the 18 years. 60 years and 70 months as an adult. That's 530,856 hours. Over half a million hours you're going to live. If you sleep an average of eight hours a night, your waking adult hours are going to be 398,142 uh, hours. So the average full-time employee who works from age 18 to 65 will spend 23.6% of his adult life working. Get that? Almost a quarter of your adult life you're going to spend working. Therefore, we need to learn some wisdom for work, don't you? If you're going to spend a quarter of your adult life working, 
I would say we need to learn some wisdom for work. So let's learn some wisdom from the Word of God about work. Number one, work is broken. That's why we're so frustrated with it. That's why it's so hard to figure out. Work is broken. To, to, to see when work was broken, we need to go back to the very beginning of human history. God created two human beings. Who were they? Adam and Eve, right? He created Adam and Eve. He put them in the Garden of Eden to do what? To work it. Then, unfortunately, they sinned by eating the only fruit God had forbidden them to eat. Because of his sense of justice, God had to punish them for their sin. And the punishment came in the form of a curse. And notice what you, I want you to notice what God said to Adam when he was addressing the fact that Adam had sinned. This is what he said. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, what is toil? Hard work. Through what kind of hard work? Painful. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it, that is from the ground, all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return from the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. You get that? So obviously God cursed Adam's work. Before he sinned, work was pleasant, not painful. There were no work-related problems like thorns and thistles. Work was easy. It didn't cause him to sweat. Clearly, because of the curse of sin, work is now broken. That's why work is hard and difficult and exhausting and all of that. But what does God still expect us to do living in a cursed world? Work. He still expects us to do that. So I want to talk about two common responses to broken work. Two common responses. There are two common responses to broken work in this broken world. The first one is to avoid work whenever possible. We all know people like that, don't we? They work harder to get out of work than they do if they would just work. That's the first response. I mean, the, the usual excuse is, I'm tired. I need some sleep. Or I'm tired. I need some rest. King Solomon evidently had a son who responded to work like that because he wrote about it in the Proverbs. This is what he wrote in Proverbs 6, 9 through 11. How long will you lie there? What does he call him? He's talking to his son here. You sluggard. You know, a sluggard is the laziest animal that ever lived, that God ever created. And he said, how long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? And then look at what he says. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and what will happen? Poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. You get that? So in Proverbs, King Solomon wrote a lot about people who are lazy and therefore prefer to sleep and to rest rather than to work, and none of it is good. None of it is good. So God expects people to work, but the first common response is that we try to avoid work. Here's the second common response to broken work in this broken world, and it's to become a workaholic. We know people like that too, don't we? People that just almost worship work. People that do all kinds of things and, and, and just work and work and work and work and then neglect more important matters in life. These people spend so much time working that they miss out on the most important things in life. People like this have one of two problems. Let's talk about one of two problems that they have. Um, one potential problem is that they believe that their identity is defined by their work and how well they do it. I mean, sometimes you ask people um, to tell you about themselves, and you know the first thing they tell you? What they do for work. What does that kind of indicate? If the first thing that you talk about is what you do for work, what does that indicate? Doesn't that indicate that much of your identity is tied up in what you do instead of in who you are in Christ? And so that's one of the problems here. Uh, the, the, the truth is that our identity is defined by our relationship with Christ, not by what we do for work. Paul wrote this to the believers at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He wrote, when you believed in Christ, what did he do? He identified you. What's his identity? 
as his own. Get that? He identified you as his own. When did you get this new identity in Christ? The moment you believed in him. When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit of God, uh, the, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us an inheritance that he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. Your identity is not in your work. Your identity is who you are in Christ. So if you're a believer, you're identified as his own people, the children of God. You are chosen. You are redeemed. You are blessed. You are adopted. You are sealed. You are forgiven. And on and on we could go with a list of things that the Bible says constitute your identity in Christ. This biblical truth is wonderfully portrayed in this new Christian movie called Overcomer. Any of you seen the Overcomer yet? Anybody seen that yet? I want to urge you, it's playing right now in theaters around here. If you have the opportunity to go see this movie called Overcomer, I want to encourage you to go see that. It's a great movie that, that graphically portrays this idea that who we are in Christ is what defines our identity, regardless of what anybody else says about us or thinks about us, or regardless of what we may even think about ourselves. Do you realize that we live in a world where the world is constantly trying to identify you? trying to give you an identity. Isn't that true? I mean, what do people call you sometimes? A significant number of us. What do they call us? They call us all kinds of things, right? They call you a jailbird. They'll call you an ex-con. They'll call you a drug addict. They'll call you an alcoholic. They'll call you all kinds of things, right? They'll call you a thief. They'll call you a pedophile. They'll call you, you know, a murderer. They call you all kinds of things, right? What are they trying to do? They're trying to determine your identity. And you may have done all of that at some time or another. But once you became a believer in Christ, what happened to you? As far as God is concerned, your identity changed and it doesn't have anything to do with what you've done in the past or the work you're doing in the present. Your identity changed the moment you believed in Jesus because he identified you as his own. Do you get that? So we need to live in the identity God has given us, not in the identity that the world tries to give us or that we may even unintentionally give ourselves. Now here's, here's another potential problem with people that are workaholics. Maybe part of their problem that drives them toward workaholism is that they are greedy for the things that they are convinced their work can provide all the material possessions they've ever dreamed about and they somehow believe that their work can provide that and so they work themselves to the bone and neglect other important responsibilities in pursuit of the things that they're greedy for sometimes that happens but here's a nugget of wisdom from king solomon proverb 23 verses 4 and 5 don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Isn't that pretty clear? Don't go to the extreme working. There's a balance. Yeah, you need to work and work hard and work consistently, but you don't need to be consumed by work. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Then what? Be wise enough to know when to quit. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. What a waste to spend your whole life working to the extreme in order to possess the kind of wealth that can only disappear in the blink of an eye. Do you understand that? Everything that is material, everything that belongs to this world is someday going to be burned up and go up in flames. Why do we want to spend our lives in pursuit of things that don't really matter? Jesus said that we should lay up treasure not on the earth, but lay up treasure where? In heaven. Work for the things that are eternal. So don't spend your whole life so devoted to secular work that you miss out on the opportunity to do the spiritual work that will earn for you things that will last forever. That's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. Here's the conclusion. As we close, I, 
I want to give you three important brief points of wisdom for work. We've set the background and we've talked about how God is and how we should be and, and God's whole plan for work. But uh, first, I want to say this, work to provide for your family. You want reasons to work? Number one, work to provide for your family. Paul wrote this in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 8. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, what happens? He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So does God take work seriously? Absolutely. God takes it seriously. And in fact, he says, if we won't work enough to at least provide for the basic needs of our own family, of our own household, then what have we done? We've become worse than an unbeliever. We have denied what the faith, what this systematic teaching of Scripture has to say about the responsibility of able-bodied human beings to care for our own. Second, work to give. Now, the world misses this one altogether. If you work enough that you, that you, say, that, that, that you accumulate more than what you have to have to pay for your uh, needs of your family, if you, if, you, if you do that, and then you have some left over, what does the world tell you to do with it? Save it. Keep it. What does God say you should do with at least a portion of that? Give it. Give it. That's what he says. We're to work so that we can give. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 7. So let each one of us do what? Give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves who? The cheerful giver. You see, so we, we need to work to take care of our family, and we need to work so that we can give. And then third, we need to work to prepare for retirement because God knows that we live in this broken world and sin came in and it drastically shortened the lifespan of man and, and it, it adversely affects our health and that kind of thing. And eventually you get to the point that you can't, if you live long enough, that you can't work to take care of yourself. Isn't that true? That's just reality, isn't it? You get to the work where you're going to have to retire, to the point you're going to have to retire from working not, not necessarily by choice, maybe, but because you, you just can't do it anymore. And so look what King Solomon also wrote. Remember, he was the wise guy in the scriptures. Proverbs 21, 20. He said this, And the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. What does that mean? That means they have a stockpile of stuff for later on, Right? That means that he hasn't blown everything he ever made. That he has made some provision for the future when he may not be able to earn that through hard work. He's no longer able to do that. So he has stores of choice food and oil. But then look at the last part of the verse. But the foolish man does what? Devours all he has. What does that mean? He spends it all. He blows it all. Don't you know people like that? Maybe we've been like that at some point or another. And I'm not talking about the fact that you don't make enough. You're working hard, but you don't make enough at an entry-level job that you just don't have any surplus, and it takes every bit of that to live. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about people who make good money, who've been in the workforce long enough that they make more than it takes for them to actually live on, but they can't manage it. They just spend it all. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? What does this say? What kind of person is that that spends everything he ever earns? God says he's foolish. Because you see, in the, in the house of the wise men are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. So in order to, to prepare for your retirement, you must work, but you can't spend all you earn. You got to save some. And so it's important that we get that. And I know it's not pleasant to think about the fact that we're going to have to work 94,000 hours in our lifetime if we're a full-time American worker, but that's just the reality of it. So let me tell you something else. While you're young, I would say this to the kids in our youth group. While you're young, prepare, prepare for work that you will enjoy. Let's take a survey. How many of you adults in this room, nobody told you when you were a kid to prepare for a career, for a work that you would enjoy? And then you got out there in the workforce and you have to work to eat, 
and to provide for your family and all that stuff, but you really don't like your job. How many of you are there? Really don't like your job. How many of you would say that it would be great if somebody had told me when I was younger to prepare to do something that I would really enjoy? Get that? I mean, doesn't it make sense to enjoy 94,000 hours of your life? Rather than get up every day and think, oh, I got to put in another 40 hours of this 94,000. You get that? So we just, need to, we just need to be wise about work because work is a part of reality in a broken world. And work is broken. And people are broken. So we just got to learn wisdom from the Lord about work.